Oh hey, I was just sitting here working on ray tracing and trying to understand it a little bit better. While I sat here working on ray tracing, I got to thinking, oftentimes, videos can be very long and not touch on the spot you want to know, so I'm going to do my best to cover as much as I can. Down below will be an a la carte option of different timestamps you can pick to hopefully find the one thing you want, because there's nothing worse than watching a video for 20 minutes, only for somebody not to say something that you wanted to hear about the laptop. And if you don't see it down there, just post a comment and I'll see if I can help you with that. Save yourself a lot of time and having a look at me, because there's another thing I don't like and that's watching myself. Anyways, let's proceed with the video. I'm going to get back to tracing this ray. What's up guys, it's Matt with 86, and behind me is the Acer Aspire New Egg Exclusive model. That model number is complicated, so I'll say it here, I'll post it below, and I'll post something right here. It is the A717-72G as in George, dash 700J. Now, why am I telling you this? Because Acer Aspire lineups have a lot of different varying models, so make sure you're looking at the same one if you want the same thing. In the past, I reviewed an Acer Aspire model, and people would try to find two $300 off deals, only to learn that it wasn't the same laptop. So, New Egg Exclusive, model number's posted below as well as a link to the actual product on Newegg where you can go take a look at it yourself. Now let's talk a little bit about this laptop because it is pretty beast. I call it a little bit of a Clark Kent laptop because it is mild mannered on the outside but underneath it's actually got a lot going on, a little bit of Superman to it. Something about Acer that's always kind of got me a little bit was sort of their flimsy design. Now they do a lot of plastic uh, bezel and a lot of plastic everywhere on the laptop and it can be a little bit cheap feeling that's just that just seems to be the mantra of Acer sometimes there is some good aluminum quality to it it is pretty durable and I imagine this light plastic is a way to kind of keep it on the cheaper end to produce it because the laptop does come in at around a thousand dollars which is about three hundred dollars less than something competitive aggressive gamer style laptop and it'll offer you a lot more if you're not looking for that aggressive style but you still want that hardware and the ability to game and do other things like VR then you definitely have that here and it's a lot cheaper than some of the more aggressive, more expensive gamer ones that have matching or lesser specs. Let's talk a little bit about the specs, by the way. Underneath the hood, we've got an i7-8750H that is a hexa-core processor. It is the new Coffee Lake processor, 8th generation, and it is pretty primo. It's also coupled with the GTX 1060 6 gigabyte variant, so you've got a lot of horsepower there as far as graphics go. Now, Acer did mismarket it a little bit by saying it's 2400 megahertz, 16 gigs, 2400 megahertz, and it's in dual channel. However, it's actually 2666 megahertz, so for what it's worth there's a little bit more going on for it than they actually say there is they do give you easy access to things like an ssd hdd upgrade if you wanted to open up there's a 2.5 inch drive bay underneath the bottom you just simply take a screw out pop it open and insert some additional storage in there uh, on the other hand you can also upgrade your ram if you wanted to go with 32 gigabytes over the stock 16 and dual channel that they give you you can open up there and change that as well so that you're putting a little bit more speed horsepower ram under the hood that you might want to add as far as getting into the actual chassis though it's typical acer pain in the but so you have like 64,000 screws underneath that you need to do and then quickly and gently kind of pop off all the sides so that you're getting all the pops up and pull the plastic off now because it's kind of a thinner more cheap feel in plastic be careful doing this so that you don't damage it and that, again that's kind of a pain in the butt but underneath the hood you'll see things like the Intel 600p which is pretty cool now it came out in late 2015 and has read write speeds that are a little lacking compared to newer things that are on the market but for an NVMe drive it's pretty solid the Intel 600p is a great choice if you're looking for something about 1500 read, 5 600 write, nothing super spectacular, but far better than anticipated when they could have just gone completely cheap on this route and only done a SATA M.2. The Wi Fi on it is pretty neat too, so it's actually Mumimo compatible, and basically all that means in layman's terms is that it's only going to send and receive what it needs. On top of that, the antenna splits up into the top of the bezel of the actual monitor itself, and at the top there's two little black things. These are actually going to be your antennas for Mumimo technology, so it's not going to be hogging your entire network if you're gaming over Wi Fi. It's only sending and receiving as needed not completely dedicating itself to your Wi-Fi gigahertz network and taking over all the packet information back and forth. That's a good thing, assuming you have Mumimo technology on your router. The ports on the side, a little bit lackluster, but hey, what can you really ask for for the price point and for the capabilities of this laptop? So on the sides, we have one USB 3.1 Type-C, two USB Type-A 2.0s, one USB Type-A 3.0. You got your audio headphone jack if you wanted to do some external speakers, and you also have a pretty decent SD card reader that transfers at about 80 to 90 megs. I would have liked to have seen all 3.0 or 3.1s, especially with the HM370 chipset. I totally don't think that that's asking too much. It should have been just kind of a given, I think. We also have an HDMI out. Now, the HDMI out is really cool because it is HDMI 2.0. Where they might have dropped the ball with those 2.0 inputs for USB, the HDMI 2.0 is nice because you can actually go 2160p at 60 hertz, which is pretty cool. If you didn't want to go with their dedicated and somewhat lackluster built-in laptop monitor here, you could do that. Speaking about that laptop monitor that's built into it, the actual screen is a little bit disappointing. It is 
an IPS panel, and for an IPS panel, its contrast is not really there. Now, I say it's disappointing because testing revealed it was disappointing. However, looking at it, it's very vibrant, very crisp, very good looking color reproduction. However, when we put it through the test, like the Black Crush test, we start to see where it kind of has some shortcomings. And uh, again, for an IPS monitor for it to be falling short where it does, it's just not great. I'll post some pictures of Black Crush tests, and I'll also post some pictures of the UFO test so you can see overscan and underscan if this is something that's influential in your decision. So being able to go to that external monitor is definitely a big plus for me. If you have something nicer, if you've got something like the Omen, if you've got a UD88 monitor, if you want to go to something 1440, the HDMI port will let you stream out to that. And a lot of people like us even will have a laptop set up as a desktop workstation. For instance, in this shot right here, you'll see this is her little Cricut workstation. It's all powered by the Xiaomi Notebook Pro. And it's simply just plugged in, charges sit there, and you wouldn't know the difference whether it was a tower or not. It's a way that I like to kind of utilize the laptops in their downtime because sometimes, you know, laptops just sit there and wait for you to use them. So maybe a good alternative to people looking to buy towers if you wanted to go with something like this where you have a little more portability and all the features you're looking for, it should cover most of your bases. But it's not as pretty as a nice tower. Battery life was actually really surprisingly nice. I, I, it's a four cell battery, so I didn't expect much from it because you're using DDR4 RAM inside versus the low power DDR3 that you know, a lot of laptop manufacturers will throw in there. Uh, so it's taking a little bit more power to run things, especially with that hexacore processor and the 1060 GPU. Uh, there's just a lot going on that I didn't think that a four cell battery would be good enough. But just to kind of test it out one night, about 10 o'clock in the uh, evening, I turned on a show and I watched until about I think it's probably about 4.30 before the 10% battery warning came up. Now granted, I'm watching a show and there's a lot more intensive things people could be doing such as rendering videos, using design space, playing games on it things like that, which will probably drain your battery life. So it's really gonna be dependent on what you do that affects the battery life. But for the most part, super fantastic. And I was actually really surprised by it because I didn't think that it was gonna go more than like two hours maybe. And we definitely went around that six, almost seven hours, I feel like before 10% battery warning came up while constantly watching episode after episode of a show. The speakers are actually kind of impressive. Now they're laptop speakers. So I'm not I'm here to tell you, wow, they're amazing. They're super good. We'll stop here in just a minute and listen to them, but they actually sound pretty decent. And, and I was surprised by that. We'll compare them to the Bose solo speakers, but we're also gonna let you listen to the laptop speakers and they sound pretty good. Now you'll notice things like you're lacking bass from it and at peak volumes you'll occasionally come into that cracking sound where it just breaks the audio but pretty good for laptop speakers. The keyboard on the laptop is backlit. It's backlit in white. You can turn it off. The trackpad is oddly located more to the left, which is a little awkward feeling. Predominantly, most of us are right-handed, so having to reach all the way over to the left is a little bit strange. There's also a fingerprint reader so that you can enable biometrics in Windows and do something like Windows Hello for login and just set up a fingerprint. It works great. It's pretty snappy and pretty on point. So while doing some benchmarks, I did notice while under load, the temperature stayed within reason inside. The internal sensor readings were reading it at anywhere between about 65 to about 77 degrees. Celsius, these are totally reasonable temperatures to get when you're running something with internal temperatures. However, when we're doing things like VR, more intensive stuff, and we've got it sitting on the table, it gets hot. Now, it doesn't thermal throttle, it doesn't shut down, it doesn't overheat, which is good, but it gets hot. The highest temperature that it got to while we were playing on it continuously without a cooler underneath it, without it being lifted up on the table, at the back vent was 60 degrees Celsius. Yeah, that's pretty hot. I mean, you're looking at 140 degrees, so you're gonna touch it and feel like, oh man, that's hot. It does get a little bit hot above the keyboard too. Not quite that hot. You'll sit around about 120, 138 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, you know, about 47, 48 degrees Celsius, somewhere in there. Hope I did my conversion math right post below if I didn't. And you'll, you'll just notice it gets warm. As, as could be kind of expected, I guess, there. There is a neat tri-heat pipe uh, set up underneath with twin blower fans. And all where it gets hot, of course, is where all the heat is going to be coming from. Seems like a pretty obvious statement, I guess. So let's go over some benchmarks. Crystal Disk actually got that 600p around 1557 read and 519 write it's pretty decent again it's not probably the best ssd and vme ssd that you could put in there but it's pretty good it is a 2280s form factor too so if you wanted to replace that another 2280 ssd and upgrade it if you wish but again intel 600p is pretty nice firestrike actually scored pretty well too at 10,296. very respectable 
Geekbench clocked in the i7 at solo core, 5,165. Multi-core score was 20,515. The CUDA score for Geekbench for the 1060 was 129,179. I7's OpenCL graphics scored a respectable 22,000. It's not terrible. Testing it on superposition, we got a score of 5,661. I usually run them two to three times, but I always pick the best one out of that to, to demonstrate. So one of the biggest questions was, and last night I wanted to kind of finish this and edit it and get something uploaded. One of the biggest questions would be, is it actually VR capable? Is that something we can really do here? The answer is yes. Surprisingly, yes. So a buddy of mine has Oculus Rift. He's a big VR nut. He likes VR games. He likes playing VR. And I got to tell you, it, it was quite the experience. If you haven't done yet you got to try it it's a lot of fun so we started playing with some vr stuff a little bit earlier today probably about 9 30 ish 10 o'clock i don't remember what time we started it is i don't have a watch on three something 320 it's three o'clock 320 so uh in the morning and uh it's just been a lot of fun playing with vr in general and i think i've gotten really into this oculus rift and i might actually probably pick one up because of how much i've enjoyed using it however the ultimate goal here was to talk about is this laptop capable of vr and that's why i brought this guy over this is steven he has an oculus rift 3 sensor setup and he was able to kind of give me some feedback on that what do you think so ultimately is that laptop good for vr and i think it is for what you're paying your money for. Do I think that you'll be able to play the latest and greatest VR games with it? Yes. Do I think you're gonna be able to play it with the spectacular graphics that might be able to come with VR? Unfortunately not. When we were playing H3 VR, for those that don't know who what that is. It's, it's a game where you shoot hot dogs with a gun. I mean, it's, <laughs> that's what you do. Yeah, it's, it's, it's hot dogs, horseshoes, and hand grenades. And, it, and once you get into it, it's actually really fun. Basically, a, a cowboy, you're running around and you're shooting, as my buddy was doing it, hot dogs that weren't even bad guys. He's <laughs> just blowing their heads off. Couldn't figure out the objective of the game. <laughs> no. He's just loading a gun. It takes 25 <laughs> minutes to load a gun and then shoot a guy with a hot dog head. But ultimately, the moment we, we loaded it in, it worked fine. But a minute or so later, you started to really get some stutter. And what that shows is that the frame rate for the... VR headset was going below the prescribed 90 frames per second, which isn't too bad. It, it kind of like breaks you away from the immersion, but then once it finally got its its feet back up, you got back into it and continued on with it. Uh, and we didn't really experience anything else with it. No, I think every other game it was pretty uh, pretty solid. We tried. What's the one we just got here? Sabers. Saber Beat. Saber Beat. Mm -hmm. Saber Beat was a lot of fun. We got some video then. I'll be posting that in here while we're talking about it too. Uh, that and the Gorn one was pretty enjoyable where you just, you're in an arena with these giant oversized yellow jaundiced people and you're supposed to bash their skulls in and pull their arms apart. And that was pretty fun. Uh, I enjoyed that. I think they enjoyed that. I enjoyed watching them do that. There's nothing like watching somebody with a VR headset on, by the way, when you're not the guy doing it and just watching them move around and do shit. That's just ridiculous. It's it's fun to watch. Oh yeah. And, and I'll admit, when I first started looking into VR, it was, I just, I said, man, I, I don't understand it. And then, but once you actually put it on, it's when you really start to understand it. So if you get this, get the laptop, and you do have the money for a VR, I'd, I'd probably highly advise you for it. But the issue with that is you gotta make sure that you have all the USB ports with it. And it only comes with one 3.0 USB and, and the Rift requires a total of three 3.0 USBs. One for the headset itself, along with the HDMI. Two for the sensors. You'll definitely need to wanna get a, a 3.0 USB hub. Yeah, to give you the expansion you need. So mm -hmm. talking about it being VR ready out of the box, is it with not the right uh, inputs that you're looking for? You've got one USB-C 3.1, which you could also expand off of if you wanted to. You have two USB 2.0s type A and one USB 3.0 type A, and that's really all you got. So as far as VR ready, yes, it can play. It is VR ready, it plays well, but how VR ready is it? I mean, I guess if you're considering the fact that it doesn't have all the inputs you need, then maybe not, but that's just probably being nitpicky at best. But at the end of the day, we were able to test it out and it played really well, I think. It was fun and we've been playing on it for several hours now with no complaints. At least I don't have any complaints. It's been a lot of fun to watch and to experience it. And I think that, yeah, it definitely makes the mark. So if they want to, call it VR ready, it, it's deserving of it. It's definitely something that's putting out what you would expect from a VR ready device. Oh yeah. Anything else? I, I, I would say it's it's VR ready, minus the, the USB ports. Like I said, you can't really play at high graphics. H3 
VR we played at high graphics and it had that stutter, but then that is great. And then like VR games in general, the, the graphics aren't going to be the world's best, but that's not what it's about. It's about being immersed and going through and, and really just enjoying the experience with, with either yourself, your loved ones, or friends in general. You like it. Your loved ones. <laughs> We're all loved ones here. We primarily wanted to make sure that it was indeed VR ready and actually performed well and played well. So that was the biggest objective goal here, was to see what it could really do. And it blew our socks off. It was really Really surprisingly good. Now his home VR system is a 1070 Ti, it's an MSI Aero, he's got an i7 KB Lake processor, 32 gigabytes of RAM, uh, all nestled into a nice beautiful iBuy Power PC that he bought. Uh, you know, I'm, uh, I kind of, I gave him a hard time, I was like, man, you gotta build your own. But hey, there's nothing wrong with the hardware he's got in that tower, it's actually really nice. And he said he couldn't tell you the difference between playing that one and this one. Hopefully that kind of answers your questions, gives you something to look at, it's a good option out there. Now if you're not looking for an aggressive gamer style laptop, this one is definitely not aggressive, but under the hood it's very super Superman. Like I said, Clark Kent on the outside, a little bit Superman on the inside. It is a big display at a 17 inch laptop, so big laptops can be a little hit or miss for me, and they may be for you as well. And just on a, a leaving note here, I've, I've been seeing this trend of a lot of companies not wanting to kind of go with better display. I don't think there's a reason why we shouldn't be going to 1440 or better in laptop displays. Seeing a 1080p laptop display can be a little bit lackluster, especially when you have so much horsepower under the hood that could really drive higher resolution. For people like me who want to work in things like Premiere, pixel real estate is everything. I like being able to feel like I can move things around and have plenty of room to see what I'm doing. Higher resolution laptops should just definitely be a thing at this point. And a last note for anybody that's really interested in knowing how the webcam is, it is suck. It is just the suck. This is one of the worst webcams I've ever seen. Now when we're outside, it looks a little bit better. It's got sensors that kind of pick up the light, but still the color is kind of terrible. The microphone on it's actually pretty good, so we'll pause here. I'll let you listen to that real quick and take a look at that video footage so you can decide for yourself if you think it is the suck too. So as you can see, really nothing fantastic about the web camera. In fact, it probably looks pretty awful. Maybe one of the worst web cameras I've ever seen on uh, any of the laptops I've ever looked at. And uh, wow, it's just, it's really bad. So let's take it outside and see if these little light sensors do anything with a uh, HDR maybe it looks better in a higher light setting but this is pretty awful so I definitely think it looks a little bit better in a higher light setting the sensors are able to take things in and kind of adjust to the range I mean, that looks a lot nicer but overall uh, it's just a web camera I wouldn't expect too much from it most people aren't gonna go outside just to use it for the best quality it's almost like an RT shot anyways that's it about the web camera it's about what you probably expect from a laptop Guys, if I missed anything, please let me know down below if you have any burning questions. I make big notes about all kinds of things that I want to go over, but that doesn't necessarily mean I cover everything in the video. So if I missed anything, there's a good chance I have an answer for you. Just be sure and post down below. Again, check the link that goes to Newegg. This is a Newegg exclusive model. You guys have a great day, night, whatever it is. I'll see you in the next video that I do. I can't do this with you in here. I'm gonna need you to go. It's okay, I'm gonna watch my video outside. Come inside. <laughs> no pull outside.